The Christian Hell from the 1st to the 20th Century by Hypatia Bradler Bonner, published in 1913. Chapter 10. Hell Opened to Christians. A book which has had a long and most astonishing popularity is Father Pinamonte's Hell Opened to Christians to caution them from entering therein. Giovanni Pietro Pinamonti was a 17th century Jesuit whose La Ferno Apato al Cristiano Pesce Non Ventre was first published at Bologna in 1688. It must surely have supplied a long-felt want, to adopt an advertising phrase, for before very long, in 1703, a Latin translation was published, an English one in 1715, and a French one in 1857. In addition, Spanish, Portuguese and German translations have also been issued. Pinamonti's work, however, can hardly be called original, for he had a predecessor in Father Giovanni Battista Mani, also an Italian Jesuit, whose works were very widely circulated on the continent, although they are very little known here. The Eternal Prison of Hell for the Hard-Hearted Sinner was issued in Venice in 1667, by 1692 had already reached its 11th edition, and was translated into German and published at Nuremberg as early as 1677. It was copiously illustrated, and the illustrations in Pinamonti's book seem to have been based upon those which adorned Father Manny's. Pinamonti's Hell Open to Christians was well known to the free thinkers of fifty years ago, and in 1850 Mr. G. J. Holyoke wrote a pamphlet in denunciation of this work, in which he reproduced the ghastly woodcuts with which its author or its editor strove to drive home the lessons of the text. At the present day it is almost unknown to non-Catholics, except by name, and there seems to be an idea that it is no longer in circulation. Mr. Mew, in his remarkable work entitled Traditional Aspects of Hell, says that the last English edition was published in 1844, but in that he is mistaken. There are much more recent editions. In any case, I found it advertised in large type in the catalogue of one Catholic bookseller in London, and I bought a copy for a few pence at another Catholic shop without any difficulty. In his preface, Pinamonti tells us that St. Catherine of Siena wished to place herself in the mouth of hell, and so block up the passage that no more souls might fall into it. Why she did not carry out this laudable desire, we are not informed, but Pinamonti, confessing that his fervour was not equal to such a sacrifice, thinks the next best thing that he can do to prevent people from falling into the abyss of punishment when dead is to describe its horrors to them. He then proceeds to divide his description into as many parts as there are days in the week. These parts he calls considerations. Each consideration is taken from three points of view and each has a revolting illustration appropriate to the text. The first consideration is for Sunday's reading and tells of the straightness of the prison of hell. The damned are described as being packed together so closely that they have not even such poor relief as the prisoner in the jail may have of pacing up and down between the four walls of his cell. They are all heaped one upon another and bound together like a faggot. Hell is not only a straight and narrow prison, but it is extremely dark. There is fire, but no light. The burning brimstone has a searching flame, which, mingling with the rolling smoke in that infernal place, raises up a storm of darkness, and the wretched sinners heaped one upon another help to make part of that dreadful night. To have not so much as one friendly ray of light for one day were horrible, but this darkness is for eternity. Hell is not only straight and dark, but its horror is intensified by its terrible stench. Thither all the filth of the world shall run, and St. Bonaventura has said that the bodies of the damned exhale so pestilential a stench that if any one of them were to be placed here on earth, it would infect the whole world, and every living creature would sicken and die. The devils also are so pestiferous that their presence may be readily detected by the unpleasant odour they give out. Try to imagine, therefore, what the condition must be when the whole crowd of tormenting, pestiferous devils and all the bodies of the pestilential tormented are penned up together in this eternally loathsome abyss. 
having done his best to make Sunday thoroughly cheerful by his description of the straightness, the darkness, and the stench of hell, Father Pinamonte opens Monday's consideration with the text from Job, My inner parts have boiled without any rest, and proceeds to dwell upon the quality of the fire in hell, its quantity and its intensity. Our earthly fire, he tells us, was created for the benefit of man, but the fire of hell was created for God to revenge himself upon the wicked. It is a fire in which the damned shall for ever burn without ever being consumed. This fire is shut in without any vent, and the flames as they rise are beaten back and return with increased force and unspeakable activity. This fire in which the damned are burned without and within is so intense that it burns not only the body but the soul also. It derives its incredible vigour from the omnipotence of God, who gives the flames such intenseness as he shall think convenient to revenge the outrages committed against him and repair the injuries done to his glory. Imagine it, injuries done to the glory of omnipotent God. The power of the sinner evidently exceeds that of omnipotence itself. Tuesday's consideration treats of the company of the damned and opens with the text, I was the brother of dragons and the fellow of ostriches. For my part, I have always felt that to make a torment out of the company of the damned was a work of the purest supererogation. I am convinced that if I were being tormented eternally and intensely, inside and out, in a straight and smelly prison, dark and fiery, I should not trouble about my company. I might have archbishops on my right hand and ostriches on my left, and I should be perfectly indifferent as to who or what might be my neighbours. Pinamonte and the other geographers and explorers of hell, however, say that the torment of the infernal habitation is greatly added to by the ill company found there. We are reminded of the proverb which says that it is better to live in a desert land than with a scolding and angry woman, and Pinamonte begs us to imagine what it will be like to dwell eternally with those who are filled with hatred and desperate rage against each other. He declares that the fury of a gouty person, when he is roughly handled, is but a shadow of the despair felt by the wretches in hell, whose very groans and howlings make them intolerable to each other. But worse even than the company of our worst enemies will be the company of devils, and the picture of horror reaches its climax when the sinner is told that no devil will torment him so much as the person he formerly disordinately loved. The face which he now thinks heavenly will appear ugly as hell. The eyes which are now his stars will send forth darts more piercing than lightning. The looks he now treasures will be turned into vipers fiercer than any dragon, and at each moment he will reflect for what filth he has lost the beautiful face of God. After this revolting picture, in which we clearly trace the celibate priest's animus against love, Wednesday's consideration is comparatively mild. It dilates upon the pain of loss. In hell, it would appear, the understanding of man is totally deprived of divine light and turned from the goodness of God. There is eternal enmity and perpetual opposition between God and his creature. For the first time, Pinamonte here utters a rational thought. If an omnipotent God, professedly also a God of love and goodness, treats his creatures in the fiendish fashion depicted in these pages, it is not to be wondered at if the helpless tormented creatures should feel eternal enmity towards their unrelenting tormentor. Thursday's consideration tells of the sting of conscience. In the sinner there arises perpetual remorse for his sins. He recalls his past happiness, past power, and past pleasures. He is perpetually driven by racking thoughts. The worm of conscience never sleeps. The damned are tormented by the remembrance not only of the bad things they have done, but by that of the good they failed to do. Thus they get it both ways, their sins counting as two for punishment. Friday's consideration is of despair on account of the extension of the pains of hell. A living man is capable of enduring many evils, but not all at one time. One evil corrects another, as one poison sometimes drives out another. 
but in hell the pains lend each other a fresh sting, and the damned are like so many vessels overflowing with God's anger. In the midst of the curses of detestable companions, in the midst of the blows and insultings of devils, without rest, without comfort, without hope, the sinner is forced every moment to die, as it were a thousand deaths. The seventh and last consideration is for Saturday and concerns the eternity, the endlessness of all this useless and wantonly inflicted pain, which is ever increasing in proportion to its duration. After so small a pleasure, so great a misery, quotes Pinamonti approvingly from St. Bernard. But it never seems to occur to him that no deity who had the smallest claim to be described as good could inflict a misery so awful and so prolonged as punishment even for the greatest sin it is in the power of human villainy to commit. Much less could he inflict it for trifling errors or for the artificial sins so copiously manufactured by the priests. Nor does it appear to occur to the Roman Catholic clergy of the present day that no church which had the slightest claim to be regarded as a teacher of morality could lend its countenance to such a book of horrors. There ends chapter 10. Thank you, as always, for watching.